Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, today, uh, we're going to uh, have a talk on integrating computational science into the chemistry curriculum. My name is Steve Gordon. I'm currently the uh, chair of the CHPC education chapter and serving as host for this meeting. And uh, with, what we will do is uh, ask the presenters to make their presentations. Uh, if you have any immediate questions, I'd ask that you post them into the, uh, the chat window, and then we'll have plenty of time for other questions at the end in which you can unmute and either ask them verbally or in the chat session. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Sean Senlier to begin our first presentation. Sean? All right, thanks, Steve. Let me get my presentation up here. Does that look good, everyone? Yes, go ahead. Okay, my name is Sean Sendlinger, and I'm at uh, North Carolina Central University in Durham. We're part of the UNC system. We are a master's comprehensive institution with about 9,000 total students, about uh, 7,000 undergraduates, 2,000 graduate students. So my purpose today is gonna be discussing how we've uh, incorporated computation into our mainly undergraduate curriculum so a lot of people think, you know, computational chemistry, we're doing electronic structure calculations on individual molecules, or maybe we're doing molecular dynamics calculations on things like proteins or other biomolecules. And that's certainly part of it, but there's a lot more that can be done using computation to help our students learn chemistry better. And I'm not gonna give you a complete list of all the activities I do, I just, want to show you a variety and maybe get people thinking about different ways they can incorporate computation in their own curriculum. So start off with one of the first things we do in general chemistry is a pH titration. So you see the data here. So we have students, you know, manually collecting the data, placing it in Excel, and uh, most of the students have seen Excel or similar spreadsheet before, so they're familiar with this technology. And what we do is uh, sort of take it the next step. We have them do a first derivative of that data. So that looks like this. And of course, what we're trying to identify are the Ka values for the acid. So we show, to show them how to do this in class. And a lot of the students haven't had calculus, so we sort of discuss what a derivative is in the first place. And you can go on and do the second derivative and that shows the Ka points, you know, much more clearly. So we step them through how to do that as well. Um, some other uses of Excel, another experiment is a simple Beer's Law experiment. So they, uh, they do some dilutions here and take the data and uh, they get, uh, uh, so they're learning both lab skills here, how to do dilutions. And we talk about, you know, fitting the data, which should be linear here, and they get an R squared value. So we talk about goodness of fit and, you know, their skill in the doing that series of dilutions is reflected in that R squared value. So this is pretty good data here. Uh, as you can imagine, some of the data may not be so linear if the students are a little bit sloppy in their laboratory skills, their manipulations. So anyway, if students start to learn about, you know, goodness of fit here. Um, in a short while, I'm teaching general chemistry this semester for the first time in a little while. And when I get to gas laws, I'm gonna use this interactive simulation from the FET folks. And uh, in the real simulation, all these gas uh, atoms here would be bouncing around. So what you can do uh, 
if you hold the correct things constant and do the correct manipulations with the, the simulation here, you can model, you know, Boyle's law and Charles's law and Avogadro's law, Hamilton's law and things like that. And what I'll do in lecture, I'll be showing this and I'll split the screen so I have Excel on one, one half and uh, the simulation running on the other half. And in real time, we'll collect data and I'll say, ask the students, well, what should we do next? And they'll say, of course, they want you to fill the thing up with as much gas as you can and heat it up. And you do that and the top will blow off and they like that. But you get them back to actually, you know, doing a virtual experiment, collecting data. And once you show the various gas laws, then it's a simple manipulation to get to the ideal gas law. So they can see maybe a little bit better where that comes from. So also in, uh, in general chemistry, we're going to probably in the fall, we're going to have a WebMO lab. So WebMO is a web-based interface to different computational engines. So now we are talking about electronic structure calculations. So WebMO set it up. It runs on a server. It does cost some money. And it's an interface to computational engines. So most, a lot of what I'll talk about today is using Mopac as the comp computational engine, and Mopac is free. We also have access to Gaussian, which costs a little money. So the idea here is we're sort of teaching old ideas with new technology. So at this point in the curriculum, the students, they know how to draw Lewis structures. So we've got uh, methane, ammonia, and water here. And they do some simple semi-empirical calculations, which they can do in real time. These calculations take seconds. So they get the, the, uh, um, the geometry optimized and they can look at the results here very quickly. So what they're measuring here are bond distances and also bond angles. So if we time this right, the students, they'll know how to draw Lewis structures so they can, you know, look at these things. And what we ask them to do after they've made the molecules and done these simple measurements, you know, look at trends in bond length and atomic size. And at this point in the curriculum, they should know carbon is larger than nitrogen, right? And is larger than oxygen. So they can correlate the bond lengths here with the size of the central atom. And what's nice in class, we may not have covered valence shell electron pair repulsion theory yet. So they don't know the effect necessarily of lone pairs on these bond angles. But, you know, based on what they drew for their Lewis structure, we ask them, well, you know, what happens is the number of uh, lone pairs on the central atom increases. And they can see the bond angle decreasing. So they've discovered something for themselves here rather than just us saying it or reading it in the book or whatever. So I think when students can discover relationships themselves, those things stick in their heads better. They, uh, they uh, learn it better. So at this point, using WebMO, it's kind of a black box. They're just following step-by-step -step instructions. Some other things we have them do, um, they can look at, uh, I, I've done this in uh, second year inorganic course, but we're going to try it in the fall in the general chemistry course. So we talk about different types of bonding fairly early on. So there's in dihydrogen here, we have, you know, nonpolar covalent bonding. And what we're looking at, the gray blobs here, are, is the electron density. And then the sort of Easter egg looking things on the right here, that's the electrostatic potential. So the red is negative charge, the blue is positive charge. So we have them build these various things. So, you know, we talk about nonpolar bonds and polar covalent bonds and ionic bonding. And, uh, you know, those are sort of abstract concepts. You know, some of their textbooks might have pictures that, you know, look like some of these things, but they're actually doing this hands-on and they can ro rotate these things around the three dimensions makes the things a little more interesting for them. And it ties in what we've been talking about in lecture with 
what they're doing in the laboratory. Um, later on in organic chemistry, we can start having them predict chemical reactivities. So here we're looking at thiophenes. So we have a five-membered ring with sulfur here. And we're uh, calculating the electrophilic susceptibility of this thing. And so again, they're visualizing sort of abstract concepts here. And in this case, if we do a simple semi-empirical calculation represented by the uh, structures you see on the left here, they get the incorrect answer. So now we're starting to open the black box from WebMO a little bit, and we're showing them, well, you know, the how the calculations are done are going to impact the accuracy of your results. So we have to use a higher level of theory to actually get, actually get the correct answer here. So we can start talking about details of calculations a little bit here. It's important. Also in organic chemistry, we can start talking about dynamic stereochemistry. So one of the things they do in lab is a 4 plus 2 Diels-Alder cycloaddition shown here. So we have a, a diene and a dienophile. And there's two possible products here, depending on the orientation of the, the reaction. So most students will look at this and they'll predict, well, this top structure is less sterically crowded. So that should be the preferred one. And we say, okay, well, let's, let's do a calculation and uh, see if that's the case. So it's the highest occupied molecular orbital shown on the top here. It interacts with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital on the other molecule. And the largest lobes of those direct the stereochemistry here. So it turns out in this situation, this more sterically crowded um, product is the preferred one. And of course, in these reactions, you get mixtures. But uh, the students in the class, they can do a series of dienes and dienophiles uh, students can share their results so they can start to see the useful the usefulness of the calculations here So you can actually predict what product you're going to make in a chemical reaction And then of course they go in the lab and they do it So you actually get more of that sterically crowded product there um, So I'm an inorganic chemist. So one of the things we do we can look at uh, different isomers. So here we have a, a sulfur oxygen fluorine compound. So the, the preferred isomer is going to be the one that's lower in energy. So they can do these calculations and see, oh, well, we're in this uh, distorted trigonal bipyramidal structure here, having the, the oxygen atom in the equatorial side is preferred because there's more room in the structure there. And uh, what I get them to do is justify the the differences in the bond angles from the perfect trigonal bipyramidal geometry based on the presence of that multiple bond. And they look at the energies here and they can see which one is going to be more stable. Some other ways we use computation. So there's something called molecular workbench. You can do a Google search and find this. So I use this when we're talking about intermolecular forces. So what you're seeing on the top here, um, you're able to drag. So this is just screenshots from the actual software. So you're able to drag these molecules close to one another. And you can see the um, van der Waals attractions between things. Down in the bottom here, they're actually pulling different types of molecules apart. So this gives you sort of a visceral feel for the strength of these different attractions. So they can look at different sets of molecules, nonpolar and polar, and they have to adjust the steering force to be able to pull these things apart. So we're trying to relate you know, microscopic trends to macroscopic observables here. And we're trying to get, give them something interactive and give them a better hands-on feel to understand these things. Uh, what we see here on the top, we're talking about boiling points, and we have something Nonpolar on the left, the, the white one, and the polar things on the right. And they're able to add heat, and they can see, well, the, the nonpolar thing breaks apart 
more readily than the polar thing. So the polar thing is likely to have a higher boiling point. We can talk about miscibility here, the oil and water. So you let this thing run long enough in the, the non-polar things represented by the white spheres, those will tend to aggregate together and the polar thing will aggregate together and the two will separate. So again, the interactivity makes it more interesting to them. And again, I think they can learn things better here when they have this interactivity and ability to manipulate the, the experiments here. And these aren't just movies, right? These are, these are two-dimensional molecular dy dynamics simulations and they run in real time. And you know, each student is gonna look a little bit different because they're gonna have a little bit different starting conditions and they'll manipulate things differently and whatnot. So then we can look at uh, phase changes. So up here, we just have water molecules and you can cool things down and you can see things go from the gas phase to a liquid phase. And if you cool it down enough, you can see it go to the solid phase. And we can re relate that to other subjects like hydrogen bonding and DNA, and the DNA structure shown down here on the bottom. They're zooming in on the base pairs and looking at how hydrogen bonding holds that whole thing together. Uh, later in the curriculum, the third or fourth year, depending when they take physical chemistry, so we're using Mathematica here as a tool to visualize some you know, complex equations. So on the left here, the yellow and orange, we have atomic orbitals, S, P, D, F. And on the right, we're looking at some molecular orbitals so they can actually learn how to visualize complex equations in Mathematica and do a little bit of coding and visualize some of the things they've talked about in various courses. Another topic in uh, physical chemistry and other parts of chemistry, of course, is uh, chemical kinetics. Show so we, we show them how to use Excel to um, you know, look at simple first order reactions both uh, integral methods and differential methods. And we talk a little bit about um, advantages and disadvantages of, the, of those uh, methods. They can also do this in Mathematica. So again, they use, you know, they learn a little coding in Mathematica. And this confuses them a little bit because by this point they've had physics and unfortunately our physics department uses MATLAB, uh, which is similar um, can do similar things, but the, you know, the coding is quite a bit different. So they get confused going back and forth between MATLAB and Mathematica, but uh, you know, that's life, I guess. And it's probably better for them to see different types of software anyway. Then we show them, well, an easier way to do chemical kinetics is to use a systems dynamics approach. So this is a program called BenSim. So we're doing uh, reversible A to B to C here. And again, they can go in and change the parameters here and see what happens to the results. So again, it's interactive. It makes asking those what if questions um, pretty easy. And we have them go out and find some you know, real, real world experimental data and try to model it and match that data using these various platforms. So by the time they get to senior year, um, I've taught a graduate course in computational chemistry for a number of years. And uh, we have the seniors, the senior undergraduates, they take this as an elective. So you can see some of the topics here. I've uh, touched on a number of these. So here we're uh, getting into the nitty gritty, the details of how all this works. And I have them do a lot of hands-on stuff here. So they're very busy off doing calculations on their own time. And I often ask them to do a, little project or several projects and they do some interesting things so here a student they looked at uh, how just a change in one electron in these nitrogen oxide species has a big impact on the structure so NO plus is linear and NO2 is a radical and it's uh, bent and um, the nitrite anion uh, is bent more because you're going from a single unpaired electron on the nitrogen to a lone pair. And they compare their 
their bond angles and uh, bond lengths here from the experiment with uh, uh, literature values, which are in the blue there. Um, another example of a project a uh, student was looking at um, the molecules used in plastic lenses, photochromic lenses that darken when you go outside. And uh, the UV light affects a, a rearrangement. So they see here that the, you know, the molecular structure affects the electronic structure. And while one, one molecule does not absorb in the visible region, the other one certainly does. So they can learn what's going on in these photochromic lenses. So some of the challenges we faced, especially in organic chemistry and general chemistry, we may have different sections of the same course. And some of these sections may be taught by different faculty members who have different levels of comfort with this. And in general chemistry, we have graduate students, you know, TAing some of the labs. So we're gonna have to make sure everybody's on the same page and we do some more of this in the fall. You know, I've been encouraged some of my faculty colleagues here to add computational experiments. And they say, oh, I, don't, I don't have time to add new things. And you know, I try to get them to see you're not, you don't necessarily have to add things. You have to teach what you've already been teaching in a new way. And you now it takes some time to get that across. But for a number of years, colleagues and I have been teaching this computational chemistry for chemistry educators workshop. So this assumes faculty don't have any experience with computational chemistry. So this year, uh, you see the dates here, will be at Mount St. Mary College in uh, upstate New York. So hopefully in the next few days, uh, people will be able to actually sign up for this. We don't have the sign up pages going yet, but over the years we've had over 300 people attend these workshops and go back and start to use computational chemistry in their own curriculum. So to wrap up here, you know, a lot of, a lot of people out there teaching chemistry these days, they didn't have the opportunity to take a computational chemistry course when they were in graduate school. So this workshop is trying to get those people up to speed. So uh, it takes a while to figure out how to use these uh, tools to teach effectively. Especially if you have graduate TAs, you may have to have a boot camp for them before the semester starts to get them using things. But what I found is students really enjoy using the technology. So um, WebMO actually has an iPhone and Android app. So I'll have students come in my office and they whip out their iPhone and they're showing me their calculation and saying, you know, well, what happened? What went wrong here? Or what am I supposed to see? What's the point of this calculation? So it's kind of nice. They, figured out how to do this on their iPhone. And my last point, so, um, and this is a play off what uh, Bob Panoff talks about a lot. So there's computational science education. So that's just using these tools to teach chemistry in this case. And there's another way of looking at that. If we move the brackets, there's computational science education. And that's sort of opening up the black box and teaching them how to do the calculations themselves. And you can so certainly start with the first one early in the curriculum and that leads to the second one later in the curriculum where they, they learn more about the details of doing these calculations. So with that, I will uh, mute myself and let uh, Mark Perry talk about his part. For those, thank you, Sean, very much. For those who might have come in late, we're gonna, uh, I see there's already some questions in the chat window, but let's, we're gonna hold those until after Mark's presentation, then we we'll, should have plenty of time at the end to answer all your questions. So for, so I'd like to, Mark Perry, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, do your presentation. Thanks, uh, I'm Mark Perry and uh, I'm a, chemistry faculty at Sonoma State University. And I'll talk to you today about how we use uh, computational chemistry in our curriculum. Just like Sean, we use it all across the curriculum from first year to senior year. Uh, and what I'm gonna focus on today is uh, my website. It's called ChemCompute. It's a science gateway, uh, which is a fancy term for a website. Uh, and we use this website for our computational studies here. Is it sharing the right screen? 
work it out. Oh, can you hear me? Is everyone muted? Uh, it looks good. Okay, thanks. I always don't know if it's sharing the, the right one. Okay, here we go. All right, so Sonoma State University, um, we are a primarily undergraduate institution. Uh, we have master's students in other departments, but not in chemistry. And so we don't really have a lot of resources to purchase licenses for things. So our computational chemistry is done cheaply or freely. And the reason I started this project was to create a, uh, like a resource for people to use computational chemistry for free because not everyone can afford to purchase uh, all the nice packages that are out there that package it up for you and make it easy to use. So everything I'm going to talk about today is, is free on this, our website. <clears throat> so computational chemistry, uh, Sean touched on a lot of things you can do. Um, it's basically using computers to calculate properties of molecules and to look at them in nice ways. And uh, I believe that it's important for the whole curriculum. Some people try and force computational chemistry to only be in physical chemistry, which students usually take in their junior year. But I think that's a mistake. And I think that it's important to start them early, even in general chemistry, and they can use it in all four years of their curriculum. So some things you can compute with computational chemistry, you can look at where electrons are located in a molecule. And this is basically chemistry. Uh, all chemistry that we do, we're looking at where are the electrons. Uh, Sean showed some examples of some reactions and why is this the favored product uh, instead of this? It's because of the location of the electrons. And so getting students thinking about this early uh, is, is super important. Other things we can look at is how do molecules vibrate? Uh, when we look at vibrations, we're, we're looking at a lot of things, infrared spectra, sure, but really we're talking about fundamental processes in a molecule and it's applicable to um, real world examples like uh, greenhouse gases and climate change uh, and the computers can calculate vibrations. We can look at things like why do two atoms come and form a molecule? We always talk about uh, two hydrogens coming together to form H2, dihydrogen. And the computer really does a good job of explaining why this happens and visualizing uh, how the electrons participate in fundamental things like bonding. So on our website, chemcompute.org, uh, you can do all these exercises. Uh, there's uh, a few things that are available. We have uh, what's called games. Games is another uh, package. Uh, Sean mentioned Gaussian uh, and um, uh, the other one that escapes me now. Um, but games is a third option for calculating quantum chemistry. And so quantum chemistry is about calculating where are the electrons in a molecule and what are their energy. Soon, hopefully this summer, I'll have uh, roll out a new version of the website and you'll be able to use JupyterHub because I want to get our students interested in programming. And so JupyterHub is a way for students to work on Python, uh, Python programs. And in Python, they can do all sorts of calculations. There is a package called Sci4, which is uh, another fourth package. There's a lot of these packages to calculate these properties of molecules. But Sci4 has a Python interface. And so you're able to, using Python, set up your job, set up a molecule, and calculate properties of molecules, and then get them back in Python. Uh, on, also on the website, we have molecular dynamics where you can look at how molecules move. And so right now we have a program called Tinker, which you can use to uh, look at these properties. So these are molecules of pentane that we have moving around. Uh, hopefully this summer also with the new version of the website, we'll have one called NAMD, which is a more of a commonly used one. People use it for research. And so it'll, it'll just be a more familiar interface for people. All right, so the website, chemcompute.org, uh, provides everything you need to, to run these jobs. And there's a lot that goes into it. If you want to run a job, you obviously need hardware to run it on. So you can run it on um, either a local computer or on a server. You need software. You need the packages that do the calculation. But also, you need some sort of graphical interface to it, because students do not enjoy 
running things through the command line. I've seen this, I've seen that a lot. But you also need uh, experiments to do. And this might be the hardest part for some people. Some universities may only have one physical chemist. And if that person is an experimentalist, then they're not familiar with the kinds of calculations you can do or how to properly set up a calculation. And it's difficult for them to, to do calculations. So one of the things on our website is just experiments that you can do. You can just go to the website, click on something, and be running an experiment without having to look it up, uh, find an experiment, uh, and tailor it to the software package that you have, and then send it to your students. All right, so let's talk about these three things, hardware. Uh, you could run it locally on your computer, but uh, our website, we have an allocation on Exceed, which is uh, a group of computers sponsored by NSF throughout the country. Uh, and these are all supercomputers. So all the jobs that you run on ChemCompute, it sends them out to supercomputers uh, just through SSH. Uh, it'll run the job on the supercomputer, and then it will copy back the the data file for you to analyze. So there's plenty of, plenty of computational power to, to do your projects. And this alleviates a lot of problems that we have. I used to have students run locally in the computer lab, uh, but if your job is gonna take too long, uh, it's kind of, kind of a mess because another class is gonna come in after you. You can't leave a job running overnight if you run it in the computer lab locally. And so it's nice to have servers to do this stuff so we can do stuff night and day. Originally, I did have servers in my lab. I had four computers that I just networked together, and this was our original cluster. And I'm so glad for Exceed now to have actual computing time, and so I don't have to maintain this cluster anymore, which, which is not doing very well after we got popular. So the second thing that on the website has uh, is software. And there's a lot of free software like games, Orca, NWChem, that you can do these calculations with. But to run these software, you need to use the command line. And everything's a text file. So on the website, it has an interface where you can draw molecules. And it will convert the molecule into the input file that you need to submit for your job. It's a lot better than when I first tried this. I first tried using games. I had my students actually manually altering the input files. And that was just a mess because these input files are not um, flexible. Uh, games, for example, is a Fortran program. And so everything needs uh, one space before a dollar sign. Everything needs to be eight characters or less, uh, no more than however many characters per line. And the students just ha didn't have a good time with the limitations of uh, a text file. So they do enjoy a graphical interface a lot better than, the, than this experiment was. Uh, and the third thing you need uh, for software is a way to get the results back. You know, games and other programs will just send you a text file with your results, and you're supposed to look through it and figure out what's going on. But the website will take the text file and it'll plot it for you. We use JSMOL, which is a free JavaScript molecule viewer. Uh, it's great. It'll let you show molecular orbitals. Uh, it'll let you show, we can do um, IR spectra visualization. We can do electrostatic potential, dipole moment. So a lot of the graphics that you want out of these output files, the website will show for you. And it's all in one place. And you'll have to go stringing together a program to make the input file, a program to run it, and then a program to visualize it. So the third thing that I talked about was experiments. And there's experiments on there. Uh, uh, nothing's very pretty, but it's there. And you can click on an experiment. You can click on, you know, general molecular orbital theory for general chemistry. And it'll take you to the first experiment. And it'll say, you know, do hydrogen. Here's how you create hydrogen. And so it's got step one, step two, step three. And so you don't need to type up anything for your students. You don't have to make the experiment. Uh, there are experiments on there that you can use. And if, if anyone uses the website, if you have an experiment that you'd like to see on there, just send it to me and I'll work on setting the instructions up. And so it'll be right there on the website. You don't have to make copies for your students or whatever. Uh, so, so everything you need for a job is on the website. Uh, we've had uh, a good number of users on the website in the past few years. Uh, we started uh, in 2014 was when I started. I had those four computers that I showed you. Uh, since 2017, I've been tracking the number of users using Google Analytics, and it'll show you this nice plot, a uh, heat map of where your users are from. So we get users from all over the world uh, coming to the website and running jobs. We've had over 19,000 students use it since 2014, since, since I turned it on. 
and I'm, I really like this. I like that we're able to bring computational chemistry to a lot of people who can, couldn't afford the, the license fees to pay for the nice software that works really well and that's all graphical. So we're providing all of that free of charge to these students for over 100,000 jobs that they've run. So in our curriculum, uh, I've, I've, I don't know, um, kind of like Sean says, I've convinced one way or another a lot of our faculty to use this in their classes. And a lot of them end up just assigning it as extra credit because uh, uh, as Sean touched on, you know, no one wants to create, make, make space in their, in their curriculum for a whole new lecture or a whole new time. Uh, so I get a lot of people using it as extra credit or using it as homework, which works just fine because it's a web page and so students can go to it uh, on their own time. They don't need to schedule a computer lab time to do it. So about half our users use it in general chemistry and you can do a lot of things in chemistry uh, with computational chemistry without even understanding what the Schrodinger equation is, which is what the computers are solving. So you can look at valence electrons. There's a Pogel PCL, the Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning PCHEM lab group. Uh, there's a Pogel PCL lab where they look at valence electrons. Um, there's labs where you look at molecular orbital theory, which is always sort of at the end of uh, the semester. We do um, we do Lewis dot structures and then we do molecular orbital theory. And that's such an important topic. And it's hard to do a lab on it because you can't go into the chemistry lab and actually look at molecular orbitals. So uh, I always do a lab where they're doing computations on it. And so that helps reinforce what they get in lecture because MO theory is really a central topic in chemistry. So in addition to that, or in the same thing, you can look at bonding. It's basically MO theory explains why bonding occurs. And you can calculate thermodynamics. Uh, and Sean showed a lot of energies that you calculate. So we have them calculate uh, the delta H of a reaction by calculating the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products and just subtracting them. And it shows them a different way of getting these values because we do in lab a calorimetry experiment where they calculate it uh, uh, experimentally. And we show them that you can do the same thing on a computer. We have uh, very few users from organic chemistry. Typically, computational chemistry is kind of a, a physical chemistry uh, domain. There are physical organic chemists that do both, uh, but I'm trying to increase the amount of people that use the website for organic chemistry because there's so many things that you can show that take place because of uh, molecular orbitals and looking at the location of electrons. So on the website, there's a lab about Suzuki coupling that we got out of um, from Jacob Ed. Uh, there's a lab on nucleophilic reactions that we got from a really good physical organic chemistry book that had that as an example. So you can calculate, for example, hydroxide uh, plus methyl bromide. I think that's a classic organic SN2 reaction. Uh, and you can show sort of why some things occur based on the molecular orbitals and how they line up. So organic chemistry is, computational chemistry is important, molecular orbitals are important in organic to show why things react uh, and where they react. Um, and so, so I'd like to increase this, but being a physical chemist, the organic world is not, not my domain, and so it's hard to cross over. Uh, the other half of our users use it in physical chemistry, which is just a really natural place to do computational chemistry. Uh, physical chemistry, it's really good for a lot of things. Uh, one thing for visualization. So we show them uh, a lot of times equations, like this equation up here, equation for a p orbital. And uh, I don't know, this equation psi equals, you know, e to the i phi sine theta, all this stuff, uh, just, it just gets lost on them. And so uh, I think it's better to visualize it. You can draw a p orbital on the website. Just go calculate uh, some atom and show, explain the p orbitals or have visualized the p orbitals, and then you can show them how it matches up with the equation. Uh, in class, you know, I draw the p orbital on the whiteboard, but you don't get the same uh, visualiz visualization out of it drawing it on the whiteboard rather than looking at it on the computer screen, where you can actually use your mouse to click and drag and rotate it in three dimensions. In PCAM, you can also use it to calculate spectroscopy. You can calculate infrared spectra of molecules. Uh, and uh, it's a really great way to show students um, how you can combine computation and uh, like theory and experiment. Because a lot of times, 
they'll be synthesizing a new molecule and how they're going to characterize it. There's no known infrared spectrum. And so they could actually use theory to calculate the infrared spectrum and compare it with what they get experimentally. We can do potential energy surfaces. This is in Jupiter Hub. I haven't worked out um, perfectly how to plot in Jupiter Hub yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, this is a helium dimer that we calculate. Uh, so in Jupiter Hub, in Python, it's easy to do a loop. The, the, the loop is like the, the essence of programming. And so you can have Sci4 calculate helium dimer at various distances and uh, calculate the energy and then fit that to uh, Leonard Jones potential with, with in Python. Uh, but I need to fix the, the plotting so that the Leonard Jones potential plots a little nicer. But you can do potential energy surfaces. You can also do transition state theory. So we have a lab that we got from, uh, from JKM Ed um, of kinetics of ammonia formation. So the Haber process, which produces ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, super important historically for a couple of reasons. But the, the reaction itself uh, it has interesting um, kinetics. And so we look at the transition state and the transition state theory applied to it to calculate rate constants for the uncatalyzed reaction, which is obviously a lot slower than the catalyzed reaction. But they get the idea of how trans transition state theory works and how you can find transition states computationally. So I'd like to talk just briefly about the benefits that I feel students get out of computation. Um, I think that computational results give you, gives you the real answer. And so I'll talk about this a little bit, what the wrong answer is, what the right answer is. But it's nice to actually finally tell them one of the real things. Because in chemistry, we a lot, a lot of times we kind of lie to the students. We give them a really simple explanation. And then the next year, we say, oh, yeah, that was just a simple explanation. You know, the octet rule is not really a thing. Uh, so it's nice to actually have molecular orbitals and calculations that give them something close to what the real answer is. Doing these computational labs, I've actually uh, had different discussions with students than I would have just doing it in lecture. And so I found some gaps in their knowledge and some misconceptions by talking with them. Uh, and I've also found that doing these calculations increases their confidence with computers, which is very important because whether they do computation in, the, in their, their life after chemistry or not, they're going to be using computers and whatever they do. And so uh, just having a general confidence, increasing confidence with computers, will help them forever. So one example I want to show you of the right answer versus the wrong answer uh, is, is methane. If you talk about methane in general chemistry, you're going to do this hybrid orbital approximation, where what happens is you get, there's a carbon, there's a methane here on the right, there's a carbon in the middle. We don't ever draw carbon because, I don't know, we hate carbon for some reason, but carbon's in the middle. There's four hydrogen atoms around it, and there's, so there's four carbon-hydrogen bonds. The methane itself is tetrahedral, the shape of a pyramid. And we have this hybrid orbital theory, SP, sp3, that explains it. But aside from explaining sort of the geometry of the molecule, this hybrid orbital uh, approximation that we use gets everything else wrong. And computations can help to show that. One thing that it gets wrong is that when you draw sp3, you draw this hybrid orbitals for methane, you're drawing all these, these four, four bonds from carbon to hydrogen. And the real life picture of methane doesn't look like that. There's not four individual bonds. Uh, one of the pictures is there's, uh, there's electrons everywhere. And so if we had individual localized bonds, there'd just be electrons between the carbon and hydrogen. But instead of that, there's electrons all around the molecule. And so we want to get students thinking about delocalization, thinking about where electrons actually are in a molecule, because they're not just in these localized bonds. Some knowledge gaps I've seen uh, center mostly around the wave function. We teach in physical chemistry the Schrodinger equation. We have uh, this wave function. Uh, they ask what a wave function is, and it's very difficult to explain. But when you do computations, you can actually see how wave functions, uh, what, what they look like, first of all, and then how you can constructively add or subtract them to get bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. And in addition to that, uh, soon when we get Jupiter Hub working, uh, just like um, Sean had a, a MathCAD example, you can do a similar calculation in Python where you calculate the, the, the wave functions, and then you can add them together, and you can show constructive and destructive interference. I've had misconceptions uh, about antibonding orbitals. Uh, antibonding orbitals are this thing that students think uh, are like, like, you know, 
the most evil thing in the world and they should never have electrons in them. But when you start looking at molecular orbital diagrams, uh, in the middle here is the molecular orbitals and there's uh, everything with a star is the so-called antibonding orbitals. And so for O2, for example, for dioxygen, uh, there's plenty of electrons in these starred orbitals, these antibonding orbitals. But students always want to skip these and not put any electrons ever in antibonding orbitals. And it's only when you make them draw it out and you talk to them about it that they start putting electrons in there. Something about the antibonding, like the anti, means it's just, they're just always empty. Uh, qualitatively, uh, what I found is that students actually uh, get their experiments done. When I had them one year use games through the terminal, uh, the students got a lot of problems and I had to just download a lot of output files that I had done to them so they could actually see something. But when you have a graphical interface, students can actually do it and they feel comfortable. I like to have them do an, an individual project where they uh, just think of their own molecule to, to, to look at computationally. Uh, and these molecules that they pick are always large. They always love large molecules. And it's only because uh, this is on a website and they run on servers off-site that we can have them run for several hours. They couldn't do this when they ran locally in the computer lab. Uh, the final thing, uh, I get negative feedback as well. People, students get upset when calculations take more than a uh, Google search. They think that everything on a computer, you type in something, it should be a Google search amount of time to come back to you with an answer. And it's good for them, I think, to see that actually using computers is not the same as Googling something. And the calculations might take five minutes, they might take two hours. And that's just how long it takes to do the calculation. Uh, students are, are, are uh, students think it's nice that they can actually get the same values or close to the same values experimentally as they can computationally. And one student told me this is the future, so I just always have to put that on there. Uh, and that's, that's it. I just want to thank Cinema State for, uh, for some funding. Um, the Science Gateways Community Institute, which is a, if you have a website and you want help with it, they are a good place to go. And also thank Sean uh, and Clyde for their computational chemistry for chemical educators um, workshop, which I went to a couple years ago. It is fantastic. So I recommend it to everybody. Thank you, Mark. So now let's uh, open it up for questions and discussion. So either you can, I, I muted everybody, but you can now feel free to unmute and ask a question or you can type your question into the uh, chat window and I will pass them along to the speakers. So I have one question there already. Is there an easy way to computationally show combustion reactions so students can characterize which produce the most energy per mole of carbon-based fuel? I guess I'll take a shot at that. Um, okay. uh, you know, there, there are things you could certainly do that computationally, but uh, just because you can do something computationally doesn't mean you should. I mean, a lot of textbooks, you know, will have those numbers for what you're talking about. And you can have a discussion with the students. You could probably more effective way to teach that is just to draw the molecules on the board, show, you know, bonds being broken, bonds being formed, and do the discussion that way. I mean, I get students, they want to compute everything, but you know, sometimes it's better to learn things a different way. Computation isn't going to do everything for you. Um, and some of those calculations would, you know, take a good bit of time, especially if you're going to do a series of organic molecules or something. So um, if you want to teach something computationally, you really need to think about it. Is this, is this the best way to teach it? Um, maybe it is. But maybe there's a maybe the old-fashioned way is sometimes uh, works just fine. So that's my two cents. Maybe Mark has a different different idea about it. I like I like doing everything computationally. Um, I don't mind it even if it's uh, kind of a silly calculation. But we um, I did have a student working with me, and she she thought that having students calculate stuff like this would be important because it would reinforce. Uh, we discussed Hess's law and everything, and I think that the more ways you can have students practice with something, the more, the better they'll learn it. Uh, one thing I like to say with this um, is that sometimes computationally is the only way you can do things. There are some molecules, I mean, uh, that are just too reactive, too explosive, or don't even exist. And, you know, you can put anything into a computer and it's not going to explode. Literally, it might explode segmentation faultly, but you can you can model anything. So some students, you know, some students would do TNT, for example, as their individual project. 
and we're not certainly not going to buy TNT and put it in our bomb calorimeter because that would be a real bomb calorimeter. So, so you can go either way, but you definitely definitely ways to do it. When you do this, you have to be careful that you use the correct basis set because a lot of computational results you get depend upon how you phrase the question. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, we have another question. Do you require programming like a prerequisite in your curriculum? Well, we used to require Fortran back in the day, but uh, we don't require a computer science class anymore. Uh, in our curriculum, like I showed some Mathematica, you know, that's not really quite programming. It's uh, coding, I guess, but uh, that's about as close as we come. Um, some students will take some basic programming classes just for their you know, future benefits. So we don't have a prerequisite right now for programming. We don't either. We don't really have room in it because the, you know, the Cal State system maximum, we have to have 120 units. And so everything's sort of crammed in there. Uh, I would love to do that if I, you know, but, but, but we just don't have room. But in, I'm teaching PCAM next year. I'm going to try and incorporate Jupyter Hub and Python into a lot of the things we do. So I'm thinking about this summer of setting up a lot of that. And there's a lot of discussion right now about Jupyter Hub and incorporating it in PCAM in the Pogol PCL group. And so um, I, th I think it's a good idea, but we don't have un unit room. Uh, how much time does it take to set up and run a demo organic reaction in class? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. It depends what sort of reaction you're looking at and what you want to do. Um, so, and what level of theory you're going to do it with. So, uh, yeah. I think that's all I'm going to say. I'll let, I'll let Mark take that one. For, for the, for, on our site, we have that Suzuki coupling lab and the nucleophilic addition lab, because um, you're doing, you're just doing like bromine and stuff. And so those are big, big, big atoms and they, they can take quite a while, uh, an hour or so. So if you're going to do it in class, what I would recommend is um, just setting it up and then having the results pre-computed, just like on a baking show. You know, here's the cake, put it in the oven, and then they pull it right out of the oven that's baked. So uh, I would I would run the job the day, the day before and get the results ready and um, and do that. So on our website, there's a way to just access previous jobs uh, and the results of them. So I would recommend that if you're doing it in class. The things like H2 and water, you know, those, those just take a few seconds. And so those are perfectly fine, but, but large molecules, they tend to slow down. Okay. Are there other questions for the presenters? While we're waiting for those, let me just say that um, this is uh, re being recorded. And uh, if you have colleagues that you want to refer to this, it will be posted uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. And the link to that will be on the SIG HPC education uh, chapter website. That's sighpceducation.acn.org. Um, so it'll take me a day or two to get, get it up there, but um, it will be there and I'll send it out. Also, if you're a member of SIG HPC education, you should get an email with that, uh, with that link as well. Other questions for the presenters? Uh, there's a long one here. Uh, just out of curiosity, are there significant advantages to using a text file as input instead of a molecular drawing visualization, visualization software? It seems to me that unless there was an obvious advantage, all students and faculty should use drawing software as initial input for molecular geometries. Yes, I agree. Uh, certainly, uh, it, using a text file sucks, especially with undergraduates. And so I would not recommend it to anybody. Um, the only reason I was using it was because we were, we had nothing, we couldn't pay for anything. And so a lot of the software that is nice costs money. Uh, there's, um, Avogadro is a program you can use to generate these text files. Uh, so we tried Avogadro, uh, and that works okay. Uh, and then we ran games, uh, and then you can use a program called MacMoplot as a free program to visualize them. So we tried it both just using the text files only, and we also tried it using these three packages working together. Uh, and it, it was just, it was difficult with both approaches. So I recommend an integrated site for it. 
you know, in my class, I, I'll show them some text file input and you know, show them how it used to be in the old days and uh, just for historical, you know, make them feel lucky, you know, you don't have to do this anymore. You can just draw things on the screen. It's so much simpler, um, makes things go much faster. Uh, another question is molecular workbench free? Yes, molecular workbench is free. Okay. And there's a ton of stuff on there, not just chemistry, they biology, physics, environmental science, all sorts of stuff. So it's definitely worth checking out. Other questions? Well, we're approaching the top of the hour. Let me go ahead and thank both of the presenters, uh, Sean and Mark. Uh, I think you gave a really nice overview of, of how you use uh, computational chemistry throughout your curricula, and I hope this is useful to those who attended. And uh, as I said, uh, I will have a, a YouTube version of this, which I think your slides all had the contact information uh, on your slides, didn't it? So that if people, want, if people wanted to send you something, they, they would know how to get a hold of you, right? Yes. And uh, please encourage other faculty uh, to that you know uh, that weren't in attendance today to uh, once this is posted to look at the video and uh, and try to participate in this uh, growing community. So let me thank you guys again. And uh, with that, um, uh, I will um, I guess sign off. So thank you all. Have thank a you, Steve.